episode of the Grunge Bible Podcast. Ethan, it's that time once again to discuss, say it with me, Grunge Rock. Grunge, rock and roll, coming at you. Grunge Rock. What's Nirvana got in store for us today? Well, if you really <laughs> think, who's the best front man? It's got to be this Lane. Cat, this cat, Lane Staley, he's a real dog. Unbelievable. Episode 127. Here we are at long last. Here we are. Yeah, I'm uh feels good to be recording again, Chris. I'd say so. Does it? Yeah. Quick turnaround. <laughs> We're back at it. And uh yeah, energy levels are high. I think this one's gonna go well. We had a little technical difficulties as normal. I'm using my laptop is not turning on, so I think it's always something to roommate's man. laptop. Like, we just yeah. can't. We just can't reach a stride. Like either the 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 file doesn't work, or the the laptop doesn't work, or we don't wire yeah. the mics correctly. You know, we need we need we need something good to happen here to us. It's a studio, and then what it comes down to is it, it takes away from our ability to uh, get a second video stream going because now <laughs> exactly. I'm just frustrated and I don't want to set that up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's oh, tough. Man. It's tough out here. I'm glad to hear you're doing well, though, uh, my good friend Ethan Shalloway. Yeah, I would say other than that, I'm not, I wasn't sure if I said I was doing well, but I am. Um, Chris, are you, how are you doing today? Oh, man, I was. I had a really good day, actually. Um, we're recording on a Monday on August the 21st, so we're, we're getting ahead of the uh, ahead of the chains here a little bit. Uh, this episode will come out on the 28th, but um, I had a good Monday. Um, I worked, worked well, was productive, and had a really good lift, um, feeling good, feeling strong. Uh, and then I came home, had some dinner, and then, you know, it's just kind of, you know, waiting for the inevitable, waiting until it's time to record the Grunge Bible podcast. So uh, it's just past 10 o'clock p.m. here uh, on the East Coast. But um, yeah, all things considered, it's good to get this out of the way early in the week. Exactly. And I have to say, exactly. this is this is a markedly different environment uh, from the environment in which we recorded our, our, mo- our previous podcast episode. Oh, Absolutely. Um, never the machine forever is the best way to describe that episode and our, uh, and how we took care of it. But Absolutely. anyway, if you guys are listening right now, before we uh, keep going down rabbit holes, thank you very much. Um, it wouldn't be possible if we didn't have the support from our listeners and special support coming from the people on our Patreon page who, uh, give us a few dollars each week to help us give us some motive, extra motivation to keep this thing running. So if you're out there and you have, you know, maybe you support other people and you're looking for, you got room for one more, please consider supporting the Grunge Bible team. That is through Chris and I, that's it. But three of us, and we don't have any corporate sponsors. Nope. Not Just that. funded, funded simply by the people. No special at a interest two, groups. Three, um, three levels. There's a two, a five and a $10 level. So please uh, consider becoming a supporter and uh, you know, offering us a few bucks because I think it's worth a few bucks. Right, Chris? I'd like to think that between the three of us, we're worth a couple of dollars uh, to everybody yeah, out there that's listening. If you're, if you're the lowest um, tier, thank you, first off. But secondly, I, you should um, make note who doesn't get a dollar. Exactly. There's two people get one dollar and then the other person get, doesn't get any. So, um That'd be kind of fun to see if you had to give two do- two people a dollar. One of them be. I think a lot of people would give Drew money. I, Drew deserves more money than I do. That's for sure. I don't really deserve. <laughs> well, he gets it. So <laughs> exactly, we don't we don't see a penny of it. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, I would like to thank our supporters uh, over at the top tier on Patreon. Um, at this time, I'd like to thank Alexa Shannon, Marianne, Jade Mercado, Carlene Salona, my mother, Laura, Laura and Irene. Excuse me, not Lauren and Irene, Laura. Um, Jamie Lynn, Fuck Soup, The Blue Owl, Doug Endy, Millie, Rachel Corning, What the Fuck's Up, Denny's, Black Hole Sean, Chris LSMS, Nikki Six, Kara K, Captain High Top, Alex Long, Fresh Tendonitis, Seattle Four Fanboy from New Jersey, Faith Bittner, Eddie Vedder Got Me Through My Second Divorce, Brother Nature, Granny Grunge, Corden Stewart, Julie Van Siever, Epona, Pile of Punk, Sherry Matthews, Keith White, Eric R. Berry, D Boat, and Gochu John. So thank you all. Once again, uh, this list is the same as it has been uh, the last couple of weeks. So hopefully that rousing call to action that we just gave you guys uh, has convinced you uh, that we are worth at least a dollar a piece. And there's three of us. So. Exactly. 
Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I think I think we'll be able to ring the bell for next time, Chris. Yeah, I'm feeling pretty I think optimistic so because, about because it. Because like we said at the top of the episode, we've got a really good episode of Grunge Rock coming up. So um, this episode is coming out on August the 28th, and August 27th marks the 32nd anniversary of the release of Pearl Jam's first studio album, 10. Uh, now, 10 has been a topic that we've discussed quite extensively on this podcast. As a matter of fact, our 10th episode was... Uh, I believe that was our first album review episode, um, episode 10, way back in, uh, that must have been May of 2021. Uh, and then later that year, in August of 2021, we did another episode about 10 on its 30th anniversary of its release. Um, so here we are, two years after that episode and 32 years after 10. Um, you know, I think, Ethan, for me at least, this is probably, you know, out of out of the big four bands, out of the, you know, the prominent albums that they have. This is the one for me that kind of, you know, it got me in. I mean, it's got everything right. that I need in here. And, and I remember just all of the fervor that we felt towards the genre and towards these guys. Um, it pretty much started and ended with 10. I mean, that's, that had the biggest gravitational pull on us specifically for a few yeah. songs that are on there. So uh, always a good opportunity to discuss. Um, and we figured in, in the parlance of our times, uh, you know, because, it is called ten. Uh, we might oh, as well yeah. sh we might as well collectively share ten things we love about ten. Yeah, this one comes up. You know, obviously anniversary every year. We have every a year. we've done at least two episodes on it, uh, and now this one. And um, but it's always fun to talk about because um, you know we know the album really well. It's their first album, so there's a lot a lot that comes with it that we're going to get into a lot of lore. And uh, you know, it's just one of those things that. Um, it's fun to rehash and go back and talk about. So this is a perfect place to do it. Grunge Bible podcast, right? Exactly. Come on this here is, and it's talk called about the Grunge 10. Bible. Exactly. Well, and the yeah. other cool thing too is, um, you know, Ethan, we, we've been at this shit for a long time. Uh, we've been at the podcast for a long time, but we've been, we've been at the page for an even longer time since 2016. So you know, over that time, you, for me at least, like I, I felt, I feel my relationship change with these songs and with these bands and with the music. Um, and, and 10 is one that weirdly enough, a lot of my feelings towards it are just kind of frozen in time back to when I first was connecting with this music and first discovered a lot of it. You know, the first time you hear a song like deep or garden and certainly release, like for me, those feelings have, haven't really mellowed in a way that some of the other ones have. And I think a lot of the, the mellowing is a function of just kind of talking about it all the time and posting about it and, you know, creating right. content around it. Um, but 10 is like, you know, 10 is like the, the jewel in the crown for me. And it still is all these years later. 100%. It's, you know, super complete. I think that's what made me really like it the first time. It was a front to back type of listen. It was very intentional. And uh, that was kind of, what I liked in albums and kind of having that connectivity and, and being able to feel like it, fl it flowed well. And, and a lot of the songs are, um, you know, they're in the same, they, they fit in the same category. So they fit on the same album. You know what I mean? It, it just yeah. makes sense that it's all together. So um, yeah, it's, it was an easy one to really kind of get into and, and yeah, be able to listen to over and over again. You know, it seems like it, Absolutely. So as we do on the Grunge Bible podcast, Ethan, I think it would make sense. Uh, we've each come armed and ready with five things that we love about 10 and five and five is 10. Um, so right. I think we just go back and forth. We just trade things we love about 10 until we reach that magic number. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, I'll go first. Oh, all right. Just be, yeah, just because, you know, oh, he's excited. <laughs> Well, it's a good, it, I kind of spoke on it before, but I mean, one of the things that I love about this album is the fact that it is uh, the band's debut album. It's the first time they all got together, you know, from different bands and different opportunities, you know, Eddie Vedder come and like join in the band and, and being able to come out with um, something so beautiful and intense. And obviously like it sprung their careers and really got everything going. Um, I love debut albums and I love that this was such a hit. Um, I think debut albums are, I don't know if they're usually a hit, but you know, it makes sense. They're special. Of a bit, you know. They're totally they're special. special. Yeah. And, and yeah, exactly. And 
this time of year too, I, I can't help but think quite extensively about debut albums because uh, August 21st was Facelift, the anniversary of Facelift that came out in 1990, Alice in Chains' debut album, um, and obviously 10, August 27th, 1991. So, I mean, those two, I mean, two of the most magnificent debut albums, I think, of the 90s and certainly of the genre. Uh, you know, you, you can't help but think about it. But we've always... I think it was on the facelift album that we discussed. It's like, you know, when you get a group of people together that make music, this is their first statement to the world and what a special yeah. thing that can be. And it's a blank canvas and people don't have any preconceived notion of who you are, or what you're supposed to be or what you're supposed to sound like uh, or what you're supposed to write about. Um, you know, they had that blank canvas, you know, it was a new project, obviously, because Mother Love Bone um, hadn't continued after Andrew Wood passed away. And you know, this is their first statement together, you know, in, in, in the world after the world that had, that had passed away with Andrew. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. And it's just a very complete, complete job that they did. Um, mm -hmm. from, like I said, front to back listening all the way through. Yeah. And uh, I just feel like, yeah, they hit the ground running the best, almost the best you can. I mean, it really is just like, yeah perfect first album type absolutely. thing absolutely and, and I gotta other than you, changing their name to, right, from, from mookie, mookie blaylock, blaylock. <laughs> that's the only thing that you know i can't really get down but, but. <laughs> they made up for it though because they did name the album 10 which was mookie's jersey number that's why that's why it's called 10 so um not as cool you know, as mookie if no it was it's mookie not as blaylock. cool as, as being called mookie blaylock could you imagine I mean, just... ethan if we started a band we'd be called kyle schwarber <laughs> oh yeah dude that's awesome Can you imagine like oh, yeah i'm going to see kyle schwarber later tonight at the <laughs> at the paragon <laughs> schwar bombs dude that would be fucking incredible you just hit dingers the whole night just ethan dingers. we should we should change the name of three leg dog to uh or merchant schwar copy <laughs> to kyle schwarber i said and then our first album could be merchant copy just like Mookie Blaylock's first album could have been Pearl Jam. You exactly. Just use that as... All of these options. It's unbelievable. Uh, and all yeah. of these things add to the uh, the lore of it. And Ethan, I don't know why, but I feel like you and I have both been particularly focused on <laughs> group lore and just different, uh, you know, things that shroud, um, you know, a lot of these activities and moments in, in mystery and in and, and, and acclaim. And for me, something that I love about 10 is, I mean, you couldn't make a better origin story. Uh, for this album, you know, with Jack Irons getting the demo tape to to Eddie Vedder, who's, you know, surfing and working a little bit and playing some music a little bit down in San Diego. And, you know, the the legendary story of him listening to the demo tape, getting his surfboard in, in the back of his truck, going out surfing and thinking of the lyrics to the uh, Mama Son trilogy, um, you know, of Alive Once in Footsteps, um, you know, and, and coming back and writing those and, and sending that tape back in. Um, I mean, the, the, just the lore behind that, you know, how many times can I say lore on this episode? But I mean, that, right. I don't know what other way to describe it. I mean, it's just an absolutely mythical beginning. Um, and I think time has only elevated that story and only made it more special. And that's something for me that, that I love about this album. And obviously that predates the album. Um, and I mean, what a, what a beginning. And I'm so happy, obviously, as all of us are, that that tape found its way into Eddie Vedder's hands because, uh, you know, our worlds would look quite a, quite a bit different if, if Eddie Vedder hadn't linked up with Stone yeah. and Jeff and the gang. I mean, it's similar to the only lore that I can compare it to is I believe I'm getting it mixed up. Was it the Sunflower whose first show was Woodstock? Or, was it... <laughs> or yeah, I believe it was oh, um, the snake. <laughs> I've got the, the notes right. It was the snake. The snake. Oh, yeah, the Harvey the Snake <laughs> Mandel. His first yeah, it's show almost, was Woodstock it's almost a, with Candy. It's almost a, exactly. It's almost as shocking as finding out that someone's first show was Woodstock. 69. Yeah, exactly. I mean, these are the types of things that, I mean, they're like holy shit moments when they happen. Like you imagine, like you get this tape, you go out, you surf, you write shit down. And I can only imagine to be in the room the first time you heard, you know, the Mama Son demo tape that Eddie Vedder had sent back up to Seattle. It's like an oh shit yeah. moment. I mean, just like the, just. And then know, it works. Just, yeah. Like just like the snake taking the stage. It went like, holy shit, there's 700,000 people out there and I'm playing with this band for the first time. You know, Eddie Vedder, right? Right. You know, he's he's writing he's writing lyrics for the band for the first time, and he's singing for the first time, and he pens one of, if not the most recognizable and legendary song in Pearl Jam's catalog. You know, he writes the words and 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 the lyrics um, to "Alive," you know, on his surfboard via a demo yeah. tape that was a Mother Love Bone demo tape. I mean, that's you know, it's really sick. It's, yeah, it's really fucking cool. Really cool. 
Um, another thing that I really admire about this work of art is the artwork. The um, oh yeah, the album artwork and the story behind that. The more, more lore, you know what I mean. Yeah, and uh, the We're fact that they are on the lore today. Yeah, they 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 came together and had a shoot and had you know the big lettering and and stuff and and the how the the vinyl it's like you can see the whole band or this the cassette or the cd you can see mm -hmm. just the hands i think that's really cool yeah and um you know it's just well thought out and um you know they did a shoot it's, it's them and it's like you know there's some other really good artwork out there for albums and stuff there's there's things that you remember and then there's stuff that is too busy or it has too much going and it doesn't really pop or whatever. And I feel like they nailed it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's all the hands coming together. I mean, it really is um, appealing for a lot of ways. It's got a great, you know, great pink kind of color to it. I don't know if it maybe a little bit darker. Well, really and, and Ethan, there was, there was a big DIY aspect to it. Cause Jeff Amon yeah. made, made the cardboard, the, the cardboard lettering cutout that was yeah. behind it. And you had, you had Lance Mercer, I think doing the photography and, um, I think it really uh, it, it complements the the ethos of the record really really well, right. and just them all putting their hands together and, and being like you know all for one and one for all type thing. Five you know, against one. Baby. Five against one. Yeah, like you know that's awesome. I mean it, it's symbolic, and I think that it's it's really really well done. So it's just cool, really cool story behind it. And like I said, good album art. It's is a uh, you know it's something you can put on the wall. You know that's it. You know, it's what, what you got in your back behind you right now. Exactly. Good album, some yeah. good vinyls. Believe it or not, I don't have a vinyl copy of 10. I believe I just, you. I just have the CD. <laughs> I, I believe say, you. It's like a really weird thing to be like, no, I don't believe you. <laughs> what a stupid thing to lie about if it wasn't true. Uh, yeah, I don't. I love have, how people, I, people say that. Believe it or not. Like, yeah. Oh, no, I, the, I the, only, the only studio Pearl Jam album that I have a vinyl copy of <laughs> is Gigaton. <laughs> I was really? yeah 2020 they released it in March and my world was crashing down later that spring and summer as you probably well remember and uh, my mom knew that I was sad and, and she she ordered gigaton for me and sent it to me um, that's awesome did it, it, did, did it, it didn't help it didn't uh, yeah. help <laughs> it got worse yeah. life update it got worse it got worse yeah I was just mainlining <laughs> Mark gigatons. Lanigan's book and 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 his solo catalog. And that was also not helping either, but we got through it. Um, you know, so I don't have a, I don't have a vinyl copy of 10. Um, yeah. but I do have a lot of thoughts about it and a lot of things that I love about it. And the next thing that I love about it, um, I just love what a showcase it is for the songwriting talents of stone and Jeff and just kind of, I really admire their openness and their selflessness to take songs that were, their creation in a band that they suffered a deeply personal and tragic loss with, you know, with Andrew Wood's death and to, you know, take that music and, and open, open themselves and the music up to outside influences and outside perspectives. Um, I think that's really special. And I can't imagine that that was an easy thing to do. Um, but, you know, they were able to do it, um, you know, and, and bring Mike and bring Dave Cruz in and, and bring Eddie Vedder in, obviously. Um, and, I mean, what a beautiful result that we had, but I mean, Stone and Jeff in the beginning, before Eddie began writing a lot of, you know, a lot of the music and playing guitar and whatnot, um, Stone and Jeff, what incredible songwriters they are. I think people often yeah. forget that. Um, similarly that we always talk about, you know, you forget about how great of a guitarist Chris Cornell is because he's such a good singer, you know, because Eddie Vedder's voice is so iconic. You kind of forget, you know, where the music was coming from and whose brains you know, created those riffs and, and, and the, those arrangements. And in the early days, there's a lot of Stone and Jeff. Mm -hmm. I love yeah, that. Very, very good point. Yeah. So good reminder. You reminded me too, you know what I mean? Like, I, that's what everybody thinks for. it comes from the pen of Eddie Vedder, but not always. Let me not go back always. to the beginning. Speaking of some of the stuff, uh, this one I think is kind of a joint one because this is, we shared our, our, the stuff that we liked and we, that we only, um were aligned on one of them and that might have been semi-planned because we made sure we didn't overlap but uh we both picked a song we were both there's a song on there that we both uh or is very special i actually included jeremy as well because i think jeremy and release um i think are gifts from this album i mean there's a ton of gifts on there but you know more most specifically being a dead 
dead horse here because we've done this a lot on on the podcast. But release is really special to to Chris and I, and we've seen that was the opening song to the uh, 2016 show that we saw, and then a very important song um, when we were getting into the band in the beginning. So just the fact that this album contains that one song that made us fans is something I like about it. You know what I mean? Like it's just oh, a yeah. great hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. And, and the crazy thing for me, Ethan, um, I'm co-signing this because this was released was one of the other th- yeah. things that I had listed in my five. Um, even to this day, like I still have conversations with Pearl Jam fans and inevitably you, you talk about the shows that you've seen and and, you know, the chase to get those songs that you want to hear live. Um, and people are like, oh, like I got this one and this one. I'm still waiting on this one. I've been to seven shows and I'm, I'm still waiting. You know, I hope this is the year. And, and I. I don't really have much to say in that conversation because I'm like, there was one song that I needed to hear them play live in my lifetime. And I got it the first song at my first show yeah. with, with one of my best friends in the entire world and Rearview mirror right next to us as yes. we discussed, uh, we discussed on the page and I think on the show before, but I'm like, that that's where the discussion ends for me. I mean, like that was the moment that was kind of the culmination of, of a lot of things. Um, and it's weird. Yeah. Like, like I just said, like we talk about this shit all the time and like a lot of it's mellowed. Like I'm I like I, I just got chills kind of talking about that right now still. Um, and we've talked about yeah. it so much and it's just that significant of a moment to me. Um, that's just a uh, side note. It just reminds me of um, my coach, Tom, no, my coach, Tom Pucks, this, uh One time Jacob, uh, one of my teammates was talking about uh, play or he was talking about where he want to go. He said, I really want to go to Sicily. And Tom's like, oh, Sicily is beautiful. It's, you know, it's got beaches, all this stuff. He's like, oh, you've been to Sicily? He said, no, but I've been all over the world. And I know it's beautiful or something like that. <laughs> and I feel like that's something that's like, um, like, have you seen it? Like, oh, yeah, they're really good. Like, no, I've seen, I've heard reliefs. I'm good. I've, I, I know, I know yeah. what it feels like. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So this is one, way. this is one that you gotta, you don't know what it feels like, I think, until you've seen it live. Mm-hmm. And like I can say that I I I, I can be that guy right now because I have yeah. I have seen it live. Um, but yeah, this song, uh, I mean, what it's meant to us, you know, in 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 our kind of our journey, um, and also I think personally, it means different things to each of us, and um, a really really powerful one for so many people out there. And um, you know, the uh, the Let's Play Two documentary. Um, John, who was waiting for four days to be the, you know, to be up front for release because it was really special to him. Uh, you know, I, I, that's a really emotional clip. Um, and John, the, the guy from the documentary who waited four days to be in front for release, he follows grunge Bible. And I think he follows both of our personal accounts and we've had some discussions with him and such a nice guy. And it's just, you know, the power of that song. I mean, to to stand in line for four days because there's one song that you need to hear that's going to make you feel better and help you get through something. Uh, I mean, what more can you say about it? Yeah, not much. That's incredible. Incredible. Incredible perseverance, you know? Yeah. Um, all right. Do you want me to go again, Chris? I think I'm at yeah, I think two so, more. I stole just, one of yours, but that's okay. We're, we're, we're in this together. It's, it's, it's so. communal. Exactly. Five, two we're, against we're one. In this, <laughs> <laughs> two against one. Exactly. Two. Us, us against Drew. <laughs> our Al. <laughs> our album yeah our album will be called two yeah <laughs> um the day the next thing i, I want to album yeah the next thing i want to point out and uh give praise to is um you know the live performances and the call to touring that this album had for the band obviously no no performances before you have an album so well i guess that's not completely you true, gotta but, get out there but for them yeah like you know you drop an album then you tour and uh you know we got some awesome performances and and the album obviously has this classic rock vibe um you know pretty grungy you know one of the more heavier albums they have and and a lot of their offerings and uh or you know or like the sound i guess not all all heavy but um you know it allowed for great live performances this this album was uh meant to be toured you know oh yeah plain and simple so out of it, we got incredible performances and Eddie, you know, just wailing away and then all the guys just you know, crushing. Jumping. Yeah. The young, the young side of it. So um, I think we have, you know, we have this album to thank for all the live performances that we mm-hmm. kind of got for the next four or five years. And then yeah, I still play it all, but I think it really kickstarted the, 
who they were as a touring band yeah, came uh, from this that album. was their identity i think exactly. and that contributed so much to so much to the lore that we that we all hold dear it all comes um, back and something something that i really love selfishly um about how extensively they played live in 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 91 but especially 92 um you know they only had 10 right and they they had a couple of covers that they would do like they do bab o'reilly they do i got a feeling you know some of the 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 b-sides you know the footsteps and the lead betters and whatnot um but I mean, their set list, there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity for variation because they didn't have that many songs. And there exists still today such a treasure trove of live video and performances. And pretty much like, you know, you can go you can go through hours and hours of footage of, of just one song if you wanted to. I mean, you could watch so many different versions of Alive from 1992. And, and, and you know, the one constant is that energy and that intensity that they approached, um, you know, that they approached their performances with. And that's something else that I really love about this band. And, and I think it, the... The, the album in the studio and in the, and in live settings, they're very complimentary of one another because I think for me, like I just feel that the, the palpability and the, and the palpable feeling of, of that dream that they all had and the intensity that they, their unmitigated focus towards that dream and towards their music. Um, you know, all of these guys had, you know, at one point or another, um, had a previous band not work out or had quit music in Mike McCready's case and had gone to college and had cut their hair to go to college or whatever. And, you know, in, in Stone and Jeff, you know, losing, you know, losing their front man and losing their band and Eddie Vedder kind of toiling a little bit in obscurity and, um, you know, working as a security guard and working, you know, as, uh, you know, uh, working, you know, backstage at different venues and whatnot. And, you know, it's kind of one of those, like, it's like your last best chance. So you can feel the fact that they put everything towards it. And for me, that spirit, I still feel that intent. And I think that's what drew me to it because, you know, we discovered it and we got heavy into it when we were, what, 18, 19, 20 years old. And I think those feelings, um, you know, you feel that intensity and that drive to be something and make something, um, I think at many different points in your life, but it's special and it just means something different and it means something more when you're that age, I think 1920. And, uh, you know, it was the perfect time to get into this music. And, and I, I remember vividly yes. feeling those feelings through the way that they played and, 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 and just how they carried themselves. Uh, and that's, that's a gift, uh, that we can still go to. And that's something that I absolutely adore about this album. Mm-hmm. Yeah, something definitely the motivation you get when you're a teenager, young 20s is, you know, unmatched. I mean, I'm still motivated in my days, but it's much more, uh, I want to say intrinsically. But like, it's kind you, of like a yeah. wiser motivation now. It's not like back then it's like caution wind, like, fuck it. Like, why not me? I'm going to go do this shit. And now it's release like, me. You know, yeah, you're exactly. just out now there, like, like, hands you know, up. Yeah, because like you're playing the game before. No you know safeguard. The, you don't know how the game works yet because you're playing it for the first time when you're when you're a kid like that. And. You know, now mm -hmm. in all of our infinite wisdom, uh, right. you know, it's tough. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. This, this album for me, it's always, it's always going to be that one. Mm -hmm. Um, is it my turn? It is your turn. I only have one left, so. I only have one left as well. Amazing. And I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and I'll just shout out Eddie Vedder and his vocals on this album and what he does, obviously through the entire I mean, you could shout out everybody on the band, but um, yeah, his his vocals and and this album is the sweet spot. Uh, it's what I it's what I like from from him and what he what he offers. And um, you know, you have the the release side of it and the really big hitting stuff, and obviously the Jeremy, the really kind of like aggressive and poignant stuff. And then he obviously you goes like into the, the blacks choruses, and the gardens of the, the blacks. World, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's um, yeah, you get the really like big Eddie Vedder and then the aggressive side. It's just a good mix. Obviously we can go on about his vocals, but um, yeah, I think I, I love this album because Eddie's singing on it. You know what I mean? I mean, it's pretty yeah. simple to say, but like, mm -hmm. this is, this is where Eddie Vedder stepped on the stage. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you shouted out an individual member of the band because I'm closing uh, my last thing that I love about this record. And I hate to like, I hate to be the person that like says the like the whole like oh not many like X fans know this fact about this thing that they're purportedly fans of but like I do think there's a good amount of Pearl Jam fans out there that don't know that Dave Abrazis wasn't the drummer for Ten it was it was Dave Cruzen yeah. um, and I think he brings 
such a unique aspect to this album. Um, and, you know, without having the technical ear for it, um, you know, there's just something different about it. Uh, and his contributions, I'm really happy that he was able to stand with Pearl Jam when they were inducted. And he was inducted alongside them into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for whatever that's worth. Obviously, we've discussed that in the past. But um, mm-hmm. it's important that people don't forget about Dave Cruzen and his contributions to the 10 album. Uh, you know, he did all of the drumming for it. And, and you know, he didn't get to tour. He had left the band um Prior to you know them touring this album, you know he was struggling with a lot of different things. But he went on to drum uh, in Hovercraft, Unified Theory, Candlebox, a couple of turns in Candlebox. But um, Dave Cruzen, really really talented drummer, um, and he fit what they were doing in the studio at the time. Uh, and I'm glad he's on the record. Um, I think yeah. you know if you had if you had Abruzis in there, obviously it would be much much harder and powerful. Um, but I think Dave had this perfect nuance. And like you said, just as Eddie's vocals go up and they go down and he's got the, you know, the delicate parts and he's got the big booming parts. I think Dave was able to complement that very, very well behind the kit, uh, in a way that I don't think, you know, any of the other Pearl Jam drummers would have been able to do at the time, uh, had they been called in in 1990, 1991. So, uh, Dave Cruz, and that's the, that's the fifth thing that I love about 10. Yeah, it's a good point because yeah, Abrazis obviously did the tour with them, so it's really right. easy to forget that you know because it'd be you know be obvious you see the drummer like oh he must have you know, new band, so you figure he played on the album, but no, not the case. Exactly. So luckily oh. they're both named Dave, so <laughs> nice and easy. Know. I mean, Sanu Dave played. Yeah, so on of course the it was tour Dave. album. Yep. Yeah, both. You got two Daves, two Mats, and a and a Jack. Oh yeah, the ace in the hole. Oh yeah, the ace. <laughs> and we've got the Jack boom Irons. now. We're laying the boom down <laughs> for all the people on YouTube. <laughs> boom Gasper. Ethan has this cup holder of Pearl Jam. Notably, it's a press shot it with holder. with Boom Gasper in it. Um, and he's in the habit of whenever we're preparing to record podcast episodes, um, he will randomly flash it in front of the screen uh, at a moment when I need it. Sometimes you just need to, you know, you need so- to see the man. You know, and and that's, that's what we right. do. So, people gotta people, face your maker. <laughs> exactly. I posted um a couple couple of weeks ago. I posted um wasted reprise uh, from the avocado album because it's uh it's Boom Gasper accompanying Eddie Vedder. I posted. I was like, this one's for Boom. And uh, Eddie Vedder's daughter Olivia commented on it and <laughs> just said King. I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I think I replied. I was like, I believe in Boom Gasper supremacy. So um, I'm glad, you know, that, that in, in all facets of the Vetter family, uh, the Boom is appreciated. Yeah, they understand. So that begs the question. You think uh, the chances are Eddie has seen something that we've posted? I think so. That's a good. But chance. the question is, has Boom seen? I, that, that that's the thing. <laughs> well, that's the thing. We use Eddie to get to Boom now. It's going to be great. Yes, that's great Trojan horse. It's not about Eddie. It's not about McCready. It's not about Cantrell. It's Pat Cameron. It's about Boom. If I can, I'm yeah, that's Gasper. it. I'm going to really, I'm going to throw off if I ever get into an interview with, say, Matt Cameron or, uh, you know, Eddie Vedder and stuff, or yeah, simply shift the focus to Boom. Yeah. And just ask about him right up. So what was it like playing with him? <laughs> yeah, like meeting him for the first time. Like, what, is it, what does he bring? Um, I love the oh, fact man. that Boom's out there. It's it's kind of sick. Heck yeah. Hell yeah, man. Uh, hell so, yeah. So so that's great. So we, we did 10 Things We Love About 10. We did get to discuss some canned heat a little bit. Uh, I want to go we, back. More canned heat. <laughs> yeah, me too. Let's talk about the sunflower <laughs> <laughs> and the bear and the blind owl. And we got to discuss some Boom Gasper. Larry so. the mole tail. <laughs> oh, the mole. Dude. I posted this morning. The amount of times that you've said Larry the Mole Taylor to me in the last seven, five, it's seven days is, is I, incredible. I posted, I posted a video of uh, to drum up support for episode one twenty six. I posted a video of them playing on the road live in nineteen seventy, and so, I'm so always so impressed by the mole man, dude. The way he pounds on that bass, and he's dude, not a they, big guy, but it all... makes the bass look so small in his hands. It's <laughs> unbelievable. It's like a magic trick. Oh yeah, dude. That rhythm section is. Dude. All star, all star cast. Dude, so and good. I, Taylor. Honestly, they have just they have so much like stoic energy up there, aligned oh, yeah. with like this intensity and and, and you know they're in control, they're like but they're also contradictions. grooving. It's crazy. Yeah, like they're um, they're in control of the boogie. 
You yeah. know, I mean, the boogie is taking they're over. Ministers but they're ministers of it. Like they, they, yes. they are. They're the prescribing doctor. Like they tell you yeah. how much boogie and when. And I mean, just, you could ask them how they do that, and they say we're not doing anything. The boogie right. is doing it. You know what I mean? This yeah. is we're, uh, they're being you, taken over. They're yeah. a surrogate. Exactly. Boogie. Right. And this afternoon, um, I was spinning their uh, 1969 album, Live in the Blues. And the last two tracks, Refried Boogie Part 1 and Refried Boogie Part 2, each of which are 20 minutes long. Yes, that's so um, say. Just They're absolutely wrong. incredible. Um, dude, they just lay it down. Like this can Heat era for us is not ending anytime soon. No. Um, like I said, it's, it's, we're, it's a renaissance, really. I mean, yeah. we're coming back and realizing just how important this band was i need we need more i need more i need to find if there's a i need to look for a like a documentary or something and, and hear some we should some and if devoted there's not, if there's not one let's make one. Oh yeah that'd be Why awesome not? i would dump grunge bible to to do like a sure. i go on Film like a, two, a two year sabbatical from grunge bible just to uh, <laughs> you know like focus on on the canned heat project better ecology exactly alan was a devoted ecologist he was a, you know he was a devoted ecologist very important so if you guys are still listening you've learned um i'll give maybe a little bit more about 10 that you didn't know maybe you knew everything and you came for the canned heat i'm not sure there's at least but, one person out there who came for the canned heat yeah i think so it's me um yeah, it's me. <laughs> Shocker, it's me. Uh, so thank you very much for listening to this uh, episode and making it to this point. Please um, give us a like, give us a review, positive or negative. Uh, we don't really care. Um, we just want your feedback. And uh, and if it's good or bad, maybe we'll read it online. Some of my favorite times is when we get to hear Absolutely. live live playback of uh, some people's thoughts on the show. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, and and a quick numbers update, Ethan. So we have uh, two hundred nine reviews on uh, on Spotify, and we're still nice. proudly carrying a perfect five star rating. Um, so that's, that's pretty awesome. great. I imagine if we keep going to the well of canned heat, that'll stay right at five stars. Yeah. Um, additionally, over on Apple Maybe Podcasts, even higher. exactly. They might they might the vaunted sixth star just for us. Um, over on Apple Podcast, uh, we had a couple of run-ins with some people who weren't too happy with us. So we've got 86 reviews, and we're rolling along at 4.8 stars, which is good. Hmm. So uh, the the written reviews makes... are a little lacking. Uh, so what hopefully, do you mean? There haven't been many of them. I need some more. I need, need, need yeah. to know what people think. Those are the real reviews. I mean, anybody yeah. can click buy. Anybody can but click a you... star, exactly. Yeah. So does that, does that tell you anything that the Apple subscribers – like versus the Spotify subscribers, like we have more Spotify people saying that we're a five star and then the other Apple. Well, it's interesting more, because more not, stuck up on Apple. Well, I what don't do know because <laughs> it's interesting not, not to bore the people, but the statistical majority of our listeners are on Apple podcasts. Um, yeah. Like like fifty percent, they have the plurality. Uh, in other words, I use Apple for, but they're podcasts. less likely to review. I guess I think I think the interface is a little bit more cumbersome because on Spotify, I mean, you pull up the you pull up the podcast and the rating is right there, and you just click on it, and you're yeah. in and out in two seconds. But um, I don't know. Uh, but this is your call to action if if you've listened to us and and you don't want to support us on Patreon because it's too expensive, uh, and you don't want to give us you know sixty seven cents a piece or whatever it may be, uh, leave a review. Uh, you know, that's perfect too. Or share us with a friend. Uh, that's the way these things get done, you know, one by one. So uh, we thank you for your time today. We also thank our producer, Drew McFadden, for all of his work. Masterful job he did last week on the episode. Um, basically, Easy. the episode last week, it, it came in, finished at 33 minutes. Um, there were there were 26 minutes of cuts that he had to I'm make. Saying, it was about an hour total that he yeah. had to... Sift through. Half of it was completely unusable, but it might be finding its way to Patreon as a Patreon exclusive. If you're in that maybe, kind of thing, maybe a Patreon exclusive where maybe we'll uh, dub over and talk about what's going a commentary. on. Commentary, <laughs> yeah, it's like a commentary. When you, get, when you get the movie on DVD, they have like the commentary version of it. <laughs> the puppets, yeah. Like yeah. we're gonna talk. About, okay, yes. right here is where Ethan drops his hat. Now this takes yeah. him ten minutes to get his hat back. Yeah. That's what we should do. Or if we get into a pinch, Ethan, honestly, let's just release the uncut version as like episode 137. Like if we're traveling, let's just send it out there. 
<laughs> I think that's what we should it's do. Perfect. Yeah. But what do you say before we leave uh, songs of the week for the people? Yes. Okay. I would love to do songs of the week because um, that has me, gives me another opportunity to <laughs> play, play canned heat for the people. Absolutely. Um, I just had to with? say, the, I got to go with let's work together. And we oh, talked yeah. about it last week on the episode, but we didn't mm. get on the list. And right. simply put, um, you know, I watched the live performance from, uh, which I was just, I think it was one of the studio ones. Yeah, I think that there was one in France a few that was good pretty prominent from 1970. Yeah. I think I watched multiple. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of good ones a, out there. That song, because that was yeah, their, that it's was so one much fun. It's yeah. so much fun. And I was in a state where I was listening to it, and like, let's work together. Just made so like I just wanted to work. I just wanted to you know, let's work together. Work people and and enter and being close and it's and communal. getting things done. And I yes, I was very like motivated to like. Well, that's everything out that there. those guys and, in the and, band were about too. The whole time, the whole I decade, you know, yeah. more love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I just felt it, it felt right. So I was, you're right. And it's what the, it's what the band stood for. And, yeah. uh, and that's, like, and that's what the boogie is working exactly. together. That's exactly. It. And, and the boogie, it's not about it. No, it's not about who gets the credit. And that's the one thing that we were, we were floored by. I mean, because Bob, when they were both living, you know, Bob and Alan would trade off, you know, lead vocal duties and, you know, they would be fully supporting the other one when it was their chance and their turn to take the stage. And let's work together as the distinction of being their highest charting song that features Bob Height on vocals. Uh, previously, it was on the road again and going up the country that were their uh, successful um, singles uh, in the charts. But let's work together did its thing and got up there and rightfully so because the bear needs to be heard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chris. Your turn for so, songs of the week. What do you got? I I'm 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 veering away uh, from canned heat. Actually, I have I have another song. Um, I'm going with a song from Glass Animals, uh, their 2016 album How to Be a Human Being. Um, it's the final song in the album. It's called Agnes. And um, Ethan, I'm, I saw you post that on your personal. Today. Yeah, man. So I I heard it consciously for the first time like i made note of like oh i'm listening to this song i like it i added it to my playlist like a couple of weeks ago and then i forgot about it and then randomly it popped up in my head and got stuck in my head like the last couple of days but i couldn't remember what song it was and i didn't have enough of like the lyrics to like reverse engineer google search it and figure it out and i was like oh fuck like what is this song i want to know like it's just been stuck in my head the chorus like the just like the hum of the chorus um but i put on the very playlist that evidently i had added it to last night when i was getting ready for bed and i found it um, and dude, it's, it's such a good song. And, and I read a little bit on the backstory, um, and this, this album, how to be a human being released in 2016, I guess the, um, uh, the, the lead lyricist, uh, and singer, uh, for glass animals wrote all of these songs about different people that they encountered during their first tour of the, the record that came before this one. They wrote all songs about different people except this last one, uh, Agnes, and, and they wrote it about a personal experience about losing somebody uh, who was close to them to suicide. Um, and, and, and knowing that, like I loved the song beforehand, but then you know it just kind of took on a different weight um, after I learned that story. And it's such a good song. It's so emotional and just like the the throes of emotion and and you know not knowing where to go or what to do, um, yeah. It's just it's a really special one. Like it's one of those like I heard and like I know it's gonna be one that I love for a long time. Like the same way that the first time I heard another one that pops out recently, like Old Friends by Pine Grove. When I heard that for the first time, I'm like this is gonna be one of my favorite songs for a long time. And, and I feel that way about this one. So worthy of consideration and listing on songs of the week. I love class animals. Yeah. So good. I, I would put money that uh, our producer drew also really loves class animals because yeah. they do some awesome stuff with sound. Their, their it's album. So Dream, interesting. Their it's dreamland such album. An interesting. It's so listen. good. Yeah. 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 They're really, really fun. They're like, you know, tame and for a little bit younger generation or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In so a way, can't, can't heat and glass animals have been my right and left hand men this week. Two beautiful band names, just incredible band names, yeah. glass animals and canned heat right up there with Mookie Blaylock and Kyle Schwarber. Yes, exactly. Oh man. Good calls. Good calls. Yeah, man. Another hit in the books. Uh, that, just about does it, I think, for episode number 127, the last one of August. Uh, another next, August episode done. Exactly. Another one done. We'll see you next year, August uh, August 2024, because we're all done now. Um, but next up, Ethan, is the birthday month. The big 
month of the year. Yeah, this yeah. is my favorite month of the year, obviously, for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Football starts. Fall starts. The birthday zone. Birthdays start. The list goes on. It's all coming, man. I'm super pumped. I think it's going to be some of our best work. Some of our best so work. Too. I think but so, too. For now, we have to close out August. So August and everything after. The other day, Chris, I'll say this. You sent me... Not even sure what song. Late at yes, night. It was, it was colorblind. You sent me colorblind, and I needed it because I was feeling colorblind. It was... Mm-hmm. Um, and I just put on Counting Crows, and I, I fell asleep to it, dude. I, I, I was I was getting into it, and I just like, I just fell asleep to it, and it was just incredible. Forgot how good uh, Duritz is, and yeah, and yeah. I forget, I needed, but I sometimes late at night, it just it just works, and it's different you know, in August and everything after. I'm after everything. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you again. Rock and roll. Stay safe. Stay heavy. Stay safe and stay heavy. Take care, everybody. You just copy me? I did copy you. I, I can do what I want. It's, it's almost 11 p.m. on a Monday. I shouldn't be podcasting right now. I should be asleep. Drew, fade us out. Fade us out, Drew.